Can you Twitter symbolically? G'day, I'm Lee Hopkins, a doctoral candidate at the University of the South Australia's School of Communication. I'm having a look at Twitter, whether its power can be viewed through a long-standing but recently unused communication theory called symbolic convergence theory. But first, let's get some background on the growth of the internet and, in particular, the social web. There are any number of videos out there that show niche elements of the social web, many based on the groundbreaking video work of Eric Qualman over at socialnomics.com. But to be different, here's a video by Omobono Digital. An interesting additional statistic is that 80% of Twitter usage is via the mobile phone or a tablet. Launched in San Francisco in 2006, Twitter is a micro-blogging platform that enables users to publicly post publicly accessible status updates, or tweets as they're known, of 140 characters or less in length. Private one-to-one -one messages can be sent, but the vast majority of message traffic is out there in the open. Marwick and Boyd, and if you're at all interested in sociological research into social networks, then Dana Boyd is the academic and real-world poster child to follow intently. Anyway, Marwick and Boyd point out that the difference between email and Twitter is that an email has an articulated, that is, named and differentiated audience, whereas the typical tweet doesn't. In addition, they note that the typical email is private, whereas the typical tweet is public. Twitter has emerged as a communication platform of some considerable force. Listened to and used by politicians, in a short five and a half years Twitter has gone from a standing start to handling over 200 million tweets and over 1.6 billion search queries per day. Many call Twitter the SMS of the Internet. Twitter is used to talk about topics that touch on all aspects of life here on Earth. Scientists talk to their colleagues about matters of interest to them, politicians talk to their electorate, peers talk with peers, and friends with friends. Additionally, friendships and online relationships can be and are developed around shared topics of interest, such as current news items, celebrities, music, films, business topics, and so on. Twitter is coy about how many accounts it has and how many of those accounts are used regularly. However, industry pundits have estimated that the service has about 200 million users and that the figure is growing rapidly. 
Now, we all know, of course, that Twitter comes with some constraints. You've only 140 characters to play with. Your initial reach is only to those who choose to follow you, and, in addition, happen to be paying attention at the same time that you send a message. And, as with all things online, if you are not being followed and read, you don't exist. The signal-to-noise ratio, that is, the amount of garbage compared to the amount of useful information you can pick up on Twitter, can be tiny, leaving you with lots of I'm having pizza messages to wade through before you come across a tweet that has any real, or to you, real value. But don't underestimate the power of Twitter to grease the wheels of commerce. Business, as we all know, is about relationships. I would much rather do business with someone I know and trust than do business with someone I either don't know or don't trust. Here's a snippet of a recent conversation I had with Ed Brill. Now, Ed heads up IBM's messaging and collaboration service. We were talking about all sorts of social business topics, including the topic of Twitter. One of the other questions that, uh, that, it, that gets asked of me as well um, is, is the classic one about Twitter, um, which, which is a discussion I was having with some other colleagues this morning, is why would anyone Twitter? Why would you do that? What, what do you say to customers when they say to you, Twitter, you know, why would you do that? Well, I, you know, I have been fortunate enough to build up an audience of about 5,000 followers on Twitter for myself. And it's done two things for me. One is that it's decreased the distance between me as an IBMer and my customers. And um, it's done that because, uh, I mean, I'm a product manager. I'm not a salesperson. I don't own the relationship with our customers. But yet every single day I can talk to thousands of our customers directly without having to filter through multiple other layers of my organization. So mm -hmm. that's an incredibly powerful tool that I have to reach out to the market. The other thing is that customers and partners and, and even competitors in the market want to be able to reach to me. So I you know, walked into a meeting this morning with a CEO of a firm uh, that's based in New Zealand. They happen to be here in, in Australia this week. And uh, the CEO had made reference to something I had tweeted, tweeted about in the last couple of days. Well, I was really kind of surprised to find that the CEO was a follower of mine on Twitter. I hadn't recognized his name when he followed me. And what it did is it meant that he was more comfortable meeting with me today as an American who happens to be visiting Australia with just some title than, you know, than some other faceless IBM executive we could have put in front of him. There was instantly a, a connection. He knew where I had had dinner last night. He knew something about how long I was in Australia. And so all those bounds of business that you need to do to establish the person-to-person -person relationships had all been broken down already, and I hadn't ever met this, this gentleman before. That's that's absolutely key, and I, I totally agree with you. I've I've long held the view that you know, if even for all of the, uh, the the social tools, the technologies that we have available to us, nothing beats face to face technology. Uh, for your own background, I'm a, a psychologist by training, and uh, it, you know, there is always that face to face. It is the primary method by which we communicate. But if you can get the underlying um, uh, relationship building uh, materials around you, such as you know where I went for dinner last night what my likes and dislikes are, if you can get that information up front before you, you sit down, you just create such a huge productivity improvement. You're not wasting time going through all of that, oh, and how, how are you, and how are you today, and, and, and you know, what are you doing in town, and all that. You just go straight to the nub of what you're talking about with a relationship that's already there and semi-embedded. Exactly right. Yep. It's very powerful. I, I mean, and, and for me personally... You know, I travel all over the world, and I can be guaranteed that in any city that I show up in, I will know somebody personally well enough to make sure that I will have a great time while I'm in that town, not just for my business needs, but that I'll experience something more than a hotel room and a conference room and an aeroplane. And, and much as hotels have great restaurants, there's far better restaurants outside of them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. yeah. So let's not underestimate the power of Twitter or its growing importance in the world of social business. But in, now let's have a look at Twitter from an academic perspective. Much has been written within academia about Twitter, but mostly pointing to its prevalence of use and how today's communications practitioner needs to be both aware of it and be wary of misusing it. Well, that's fair enough too. Little has been written about its usefulness to business at a, as a marketing or communication channel. 
Those who have written about it from a business perspective point out that although Twitter enjoys wide reach, it seems to generate a neutral or slightly negative response when considered as a useful tool for marketing purposes. Well, that's what the academics world says. But <laughs> you go outside of the academy and talk to leading companies enjoying Twitter as a sales marketing channel, such as companies like Dell, Zappos and the Women's and Children's Foundation here in Adelaide, and you'll get a different story completely. Twitter, as a platform of interest to academics, has actually touched many disciplines. In health, education, journalism, PR, strategic business thinking, taxation and accountancy. Did you know the ATO has their own Twitter account? Arts and entertainment, politics and trademark protection have all been looked at by academics. Some argue that Twitter's strength as a communication tool lies in its encouragement of digital intimacy. And a McKinsey quarterly report found the type of companies most likely to benefit from Twitter and other social media platforms are very large firms, those in business-to-business -business relationships and those in high-tech industries. But I reckon McKinsey got it wrong. All businesses of all sizes can benefit from using social media channels and Twitter. Stevenson and Peck have looked at Twitter from an ethical perspective, suggesting that a version of Kavanaugh's double-effect reasoning model, based on the moral norms of doing good and avoiding evil, should be used when thinking about social media ethics and Twitter itself. As discussed before, leading social software and social behaviour scientist Dana Boyd and her colleagues have looked at how Twitter requires the collapse of meaning and how Twitter can be the scene of emotional debates that lead to polarisation. Use of hashtags on Twitter, which is a typographic convention that allowing users to search for and contribute into real-time conversations, allows for homophily, which is the connection amongst like-minded people. Darwick and Boyd argue that Twitter simultaneously collapses multiple contexts and imagined audiences and brings together commonly distinct audiences, for example customer, family member, boss, parent, activist, friend, competitor and enemy that can be brought together who would never normally talk to each other. And they can all engage and it causes stress to engage in a dialogue with a, with a usually unknown audience. A tweet that takes a position on one issue, for example, can both alienate and encourage those who read it. Politics and religion are two well-known divisive topic areas, but so too, for example, are makes of car, the Holden versus Ford culture, for example, here in Australia. Organisations and individuals need to navigate multiple audiences if they are to successfully engage in respectful dialogue that enhances their online reputation. As Marwick and Boyd argue, social media collapse diverse social contexts into one, making it difficult for people to engage in the complex negotiations needed to vary identity presentation, manage impressions and save face. Now, one way of doing this is to use the polysemic and coded communicative strategies and tactics of image management practitioners, whereby linguistic markers are used to create both an identifiable but nuanced message to in-group members, as well as an easily searchable meme for potential propagation through Twitter. An example would help. An example would be General Motors Holden posting the tweet, Our latest cruise is reviewed by Top Gear Mag, Flying Colours. Those with knowledge of the car industry and those who are fans of Holden cars would know that the cruise is one of Holden's cars. Equally, both sets of audiences would know that Top Gear magazine is a reference to the magazine Top Gear's Twitter account, and by extension the magazine itself. Anyone who searched for Top Gear magazine would see Holden's tweet, as would anyone who searched for Cruise potentially opening up a larger audience for the tweet for, than just the followers of Holden's own Twitter account. It's on this idea of coded communication that my current research is focused. It's to examine whether symbolic convergence theory can still have a voice in the socially networked, always online world that we now live in. Can the theory, with its examination of the symbols around which groups coalesce and form, still be of value in an era where messaging is no longer purely discreet and one way, but is in fact the opposite, where audience members take turns with organisations in creating and producing content, where a creative audience remixes the messages with its own communication projects? Can an organisation use the theory to better manage its presence on Twitter and manage its impression amongst the various and varied groups that make up its real and potential audience? So, with a working knowledge of Twitter under our belts, let's have a look at the other component in my research, symbolic convergence theory.
popular in the early 1980s when it was first formulated by Ernest Borman, until the early 2000s, symbolic convergence theory has proved itself to be a rigorously researched and very utilitarian theory that has very practical outputs. But its use in this webbed-up world we now live in has been minimal at best. The most polite thing you could say about it is that it's resting between jobs. But why is that? Why has one of the most popular and usable communication theories of the latter part of the previous century disappeared from sight in the 21st? To get a hint of an answer, we need to dig into the theory a little, but I promise only a little, to see why academics and practitioners have potentially abandoned it. We also need to understand that theories themselves are how we understand reality, and how we use personal theories all the time to manage and navigate our way in the world. To give you an example of how a theory helps to make sense out of reality, and how you naturally make theories about circumstances and events, sometimes even competing theories, consider the following example. It comes from the excellent book Symbolic Theories in Applied Communication Research, which I know you want to rush out and buy straight away. But before you leap onto Amazon, focus your attention on the following problem. A mother, let's call her Mrs. Cragen, raised five children four brown-eyed and one blue-eyed. Because humans are natural-born theory-makers, the Cragen family quickly created several competing theories to explain why young Joby Cragen had blue eyes and every other child didn't. Now, it should also be pointed out that all the other children believed Mrs. Cragen loved Joey the most. Each Monday, Mrs. Cragen hung her laundry in the backyard, a yard that adjoined a busy street. In order to make sure that the children were safe, she told James, the eldest, to stay on the back porch of the house. June, the eldest sister, got to walk around the yard pushing baby Mary around in a stroller. Mrs. Cragen attached John to the old clothesline where he could exhaust himself running from end to end. And Mrs. Cragen attached one end of a rope to young Joey's clothes and the other end to a tree in their backyard. By mid-morning, each Monday, Joey had wrapped himself around the tree, bound as if crucified, staring at the sky and crying for his mother. Because this happened every Monday, the repeated ritual created the family's first blue-eyed theory. The theory, invented by eldest son James, held that Joey's eyes were blue because he spent so much time every Monday staring up at the blue sky. Now, since every other child believed that Joey was their mother's favourite, the other children then started staring at the blue sky, in the hope that their eyes would turn blue too. They reasoned that if they also had blue eyes, then their mother would love them as much as she did Joey. And they chose not to share the theory with their mother, in case their plan backfired on them. Baffled by the other children suddenly spending hours each Monday staring at the blue sky, Mrs. Cragen asked the children what was going on, and eventually the truth came out. No, she said, that's not why Joey's eyes are blue. But with a twinkle in her eyes, she invented a competing theory. She explained that she loved all of the children equally, that each was a gift from God, and that the guardian angel had brought each of them down from heaven to her. It just so happened that the angel brought the first four children down on cloudy days, and Joey came down on a sunny day. That's why he had blue eyes. Two theories, in competition with each other. How to resolve them? The Cragen children, armed with the two theories, rushed to their father for resolution. They asked him which theory was correct. Were Joey's eyes blue because he stared at the sky, or because the guardian angel brought him down from heaven on a clear blue day? Muttering something about blue sky and load of nonsense, Mr. Cragen dodged the question by walking off to the bar down at the corner of the street, allegedly mumbling to himself a third competing theory which the children couldn't hear clearly. But have a look at this drawing and see if you can determine for yourself what Mr. Cragen's third competing theory might have been. So you see, we create theories all the time about why things are so. Sometimes those theories make sense, sometimes they don't. Sometimes those theories are right, sometimes they're not. What's important is that each and every one of us is a theory-creating machine, always trying to make sense out of the reality that we're experiencing. So let's have a look at the origins of symbolic convergence theory. It came from observations of people and how they communicate. Its methodology includes things like ethnography, content analysis, surveys, cue sorts, and discriminant analysis. 
starting with the initial message itself. As each new study and how people communicate built on previous studies, it became clear that there were regularities in the nature of discourse, which led to the development of generalizations about the nature of communication. Much work has been carried out in the theory's name. Indeed, Ernest Borman himself and Cragen and Shields, who were the, the two researchers most known for their work on and within the theory, they reviewed three decades of theory work at the beginning of this century. Covering a broad range of interests, the theory has, for example, figured in an analysis of an internet-based radio station in Serbia. It's had a look at religious apocalyptic rhetoric. It's done some small group research, and it's looked at an analysis of a healthy father-daughter relationship. It's been used to create a computer-derived foreign policy speech that would please the greatest and offend the least number of a particular community. And it's been utilised to take a look at the rhetoric of women's rights. Of interest to my research is the use of the theory in an organisational and business communication setting. Here too, there's a lot of literature to fall back on. For example, Stone used symbolic convergence theory to discern student motives for enrolling in professional degree programs in a bid to halt declining numbers at a rural university in America. Cragen and Shields, as I mentioned earlier, they reported on the employment of symbolic convergence theory in a corporate setting where a national company was privatised and the theory was used to help reposition the company in the marketplace. It was used to help decide a corporate name. It was helped to decide which key markets to approach first and also help with sales and advertising stories. Using a mix of fantasy theme analysis of corporate documents, personal interviews, Q-deck and Q-sort analysis, focus groups and television or telephone surveys, not television, telephone surveys, the researchers were able to generate a mappable world of fantasy types and get an idea about the company, its people and its products. Similarly, fantasy theme analysis has been used successfully to identify dominant fantasy theme portrayals of rural communities, refashion them to be attractive to doctors, and then use those refashioned, doc those refashioned themes to get medical doctors out into rural communities. They identified both the positive and negative thoughts that were around the idea of moving to a rural community, and they even got medical practices working in neighbouring communities to change the way they, ordered, they worked in order to best meet the, meet, meet the needs of all six communities that were the focus of the study. Foreman expounded on the theory and its applicability and implications for the teacher and the business consultant as well, and he noted Symbolic convergence means more than an intellectual co-orientation in which people come to have the same logical and rational interpretation of symbols. Symbolic convergence also explains how people come to have an emotional attachment, an emotional investment and commitment to the symbols they live by, how it is that people can sympathise, empathise and identify with one another. So what is symbolic convergence theory? At its heart, it's a general communication theory. It explains how people build a common, symbolic consciousness that provides meaning, emotion and motive for action. It's based on six assumptions. Meaning, emotion and motive for action are in the manifest content of a message. For example, self-evident meaning can be found in messages like doing drugs is against my moral code, I just don't feel right in doing them. Emotion occurs in messages, in messages like, I hate men, they just use you. I gave him the best years of my life and he left me for some pretty little thing young enough to be his daughter. Action occurs in messages like, drugs make you unaware of your surroundings, they mess you up, I don't do drugs anymore. Assumption number two is that reality is created symbolically. An example of this is when US President George Bush Sr. called Saddam Hussein another Hitler and suggested trying Hussein before an international tribunal for his invasion and destruction of Kuwait. By tapping into the collective images of Hitler, Bush was able to symbolically display what sort of man who Saddam Hussein was, uh, an image that many responded to. Assumption number three is that when fantasies change together, they converge in a dramatistic form. Or dramatistic form. What? It means that when humans share symbols, they converge around them. When two or more people converge around the same symbol and attempt to spread or propagate it, the symbol can be reconfigured, it can be embellished, it can even remain the same, but it can still catch on. 
Say, for example, at a company where I worked in the 80s, there was a collectively shared name for our very rotund boss. It also means that when symbols get shared, they often become part of a drama, with players, a hero, a villain, props and a plot. Assumption number four is that an analytic method called fantasy theme analysis is the basic method used to capture symbolic reality. It's a qualitative content analysis method that allows anyone using it to discover, capture and analyze a fantasy and the fantasies that make up a symbolic reality. Assumption number five, where are we, there we are, is that fantasies and fantasy themes start from all types of discourse. So not only do oral conversations spark fantasy themes, but so too do written conversations, printed communications and mediated conversations such as online forums. Fantasies often begin in a small group and chain out to larger communities. Examples would be the Earth Hour, which started in a small group in Sydney and is now celebrated around the globe. And another example is the saying, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Finally, assumption number six is that three master concepts, righteous, social and pragmatic, compete as alternative explanations of symbolic reality. Righteous means, for example, the proper way of doing things. It concerns itself with right and wrong, proper and improper, superior and inferior, moral and immoral, just and unjust. The death penalty is needed for this type of crime is a righteous statement. As to is, she may be guilty, but sending her to jail is the wrong thing to do. A social master concept focuses on human relations. Elements such as friendship, trust, comradeship, mateship, family ties, brotherhood, sisterhood and humaneness. An example would be he's not being a team player. A pragmatic master concept accentuates efficiency, simplicity, practicality, cost effectiveness and doing whatever it takes to get the job done. Such a message like that would be I always shift from second to fourth gear, avoiding third gear. Saves me time and effort. The theory has as its basic unit of analysis the fantasy theme. If an idea or meme doesn't propagate or spread, then you could say it has no fantasy theme, or at least one not worth having. A theme works to present a common experience and shape it into symbolic knowledge. It could be as simple as a sentence or as long as a paragraph in length. An example of this would be the Jabba the Hutt example I used earlier on. Symbolic convergence theory then goes on to add different elements at different levels of extraction. So at the basic level you get the symbolic theme, symbolic cue, fantasy type and saga. In structural terms you have the rhetorical vision, dramatis personae, plotline scene and sanctioning agent. And for the master concepts at the top, the righteous, social and pragmatic rhetorical visions that I just mentioned. Now, confusing, huh? I could go into detail on each of them, but I reckon you'd be probably roll over with boredom if I did, since you're not studying the theory. So, I'll spare you the greater but important details, because you can always ask me about them later. Anyway, all of the elements and concepts combine to create a theory that helps communication professionals analyse their messages to see if what they want their audience to receive is what actually is received, and if necessary, how to tailor their message output so that the desired outcome is more easily achieved. But all of this has only been tested on old school long form text or sloganeering messages. It hasn't been tested in the social media environment where old style corporate language is laughed at. Anyone who tries to realign my core competencies and shift my paradigm before I've had my morning coffee will meet with very stiff opposition, I can tell you. Twitter, with its 140 character constraints and almost complete rejection of corporate sloganeering, is a difficult arena in which to test an old world theory. So there we have it. A social networking powerhouse and a well-grounded, thoroughly researched communication theory that originated in a pre-social media age. Symbolic convergence theory has proved itself very capable and worthwhile with messages that were either long form or else sloganistic in nature. But Twitter is not a sloganistic welcoming environment. Symbolic convergence theory has proved itself valuable in helping realign the messages a company wants to deliver. So the big question is, symbolic convergence theory, can it and Twitter work well together? And I guess another question is, would your organisation like to be involved in the research? I'm Lee Hopkins. Thanks for paying attention to this video. If you'd like to have further information, if you have a question that you'd like answering, or even, I cross my fingers hopefully, you want to be a part of the research itself, 
please get in touch with me via email, lee at leehopkins.com, or via Twitter, at Lee Hopkins, or text me on 0410-642-052. You can find me on Facebook, and I'm also on LinkedIn and Skype. Here's the full list. If you would like more information about participating in the research, you can download an information pack from the address that appears right below. Again, I'm Lee Hopkins. Thanks for paying attention.